Barry was that? Oh, okay, now we're Sorry. going to be recording. <laughs> sure, that's fine. Thank you, Al. Al is our uh, recorder, our, our Zoom specialist tonight. Thank you, Al. Um, I met Barry when we both worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, I was fortunate enough to win a uh, an award for my e exemplary cross-cultural uh, abilities uh, working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. My abilities are nothing compared to Barry Whitehill. He is a master of uh, rural Alaska. He has more connections than any person I know. He, it, he has a phenomenal amount of knowledge about um, uh, rural Alaska, the native groups, and especially uh, people on the Koyukon River. And so Barry and his wife, Patty, and, uh, and a third person who I, Barry will introduce, uh, floated uh, tributaries of the Koyukuk and down to, did you go to Huslia? Hughes. 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 Yep. So uh, I think the the uh, the tag was um, they were uh, the total of their ages was 205 years and they floated 205 miles on the Koyukuk. But but that's I don't want to steal any of Barry Sunder. But um, anytime you have an opportunity to take a trip with Barry, do it. He's he's a great paddler and a fountain of knowledge. With that, Barry Whitehill. Well, thank you, Don. Everybody can hear me, I assume. Yes. That, yes. Yep, good, thanks. I can. Okay, well, I will see if I can, oh, there we go. Um, and I'm going to boost this up while I talk. Um, I apologize, I don't have a, a really sterling show. I'm just going to flip through pictures, but, and I also had maps and for some reason they disappeared. But uh, like Don just shared, I started out with US Fish and Wildlife in uh, Alaska by working at Kanuti National Wildlife Refuge. Well, I came up, I grew up in the Northwest and I was fortunate, I guess, to have a father that lived by his fly pole. So at an early age, I learned how to boat and I, my boating started at age 10, 12, uh, keeping him in uh, the Klickitat or the Grand Run uh, steelhead holes so he could fly fish. Well, that uh, in time marched on to float all the salmon river branches. And so when I came to Alaska, I had that skill set behind me and immediately found out that Kanuti Refuge had all sorts of rivers. So um, I started exploring the rivers for work, mind you. And in uh, uh, this one, the South Fork of Bonanza Creek, Bonanza Creek, which turns into Fish Creek, um, was one that I could take people with little boat boating skills. It's pretty much a class one, class two, depending on trees that you have to get around. So it was an easy river from a skill set. Uh, that said, uh, over time working on Kanuti, like Don alluded to, the Koyakon people I got to know, and I learned a lot of lessons from them. First and foremost, whenever you're going to start a major adventure, you do in their language, and I might, you know, butcher it somewhat, but they call it an anshla. It's a peace offering. And I found out the hard way, if you're going to do a peace offering, the anshla, the na, the offering goes to the river first. So dutifully, we start our trips by doing our offering to the river gods. And uh, this is where we launched. Now, the South Fork of Bonanza Creek, if you've been up the Dalton Highway, and since my maps didn't, for some reason, disappeared, um, it is north of the Arctic Circle, and it's the drainage, first drainage you come to. And immediately past it is the North Fork of Bonanza Creek. And then you rise to Gobbler Knob, and then you overlook the Jim River. 
So this is where we're at that setting. And we're going to flow to the west. <clears throat> so um, it's a it's just a beautiful little stream. It's clear water oftentimes. Um, the other part of it, uh, though, you can see with uh, rain events, it uh, the gravel bars can drastically change in a hurry. And fortunately, on this trip, we launched on the 29th of June. So it was after breakup, the high water events, and you can still see there was some re residuals from uh, it hadn't been too much before this that this gravel bar had been underwater. Um, so this was our first night. We kind of get down, so you're kind of out of earshot of the Dalton Highway. And not too much farther down, there was a trapper, Mike Johnson, that had a trapline cabin. So we we stopped, and and what's nice about this river, you have old cabins, uh, you have old village sites, you have old gold rush sites, uh, you have Pleistocene sites, and so you really have a, a broad a breadth of, of things um, to check out. So we'll just quickly, this, is, uh, this was Mike's cabin. Like a lot of the old cabins uh, that I've been to in this area, they use the old news miner tin type uh, to, as lay down to put uh, the sod roof on or whatever. It must have been free to them because you see them on a lot of the old cabins. So it's a, a fun way to kind of go back in time as well. And not everything is in good repair. If it hasn't been uh, guarded, uh, things have a way of falling in or being an attractant to the different bears that might be passing through. But there's some things that are still operational, uh, like his outhouse. So that was always a nice benefit. The other thing about uh, the South Fork or Bonanza Creek is as the two come together, it looks, as you look across the landscape from up on the Dalton Highway, it looks relatively flat. But when you're down in water level, there starts to be a pretty good relief. So there's a nice little canyon, a lot more relief than this that uh, it took me by surprise. So scenically, it it really has its its benefits as well. And the last part of June is is really a nice time. The birds are still singing a little bit. You've got the butterflies out, and the young of the year are starting to uh, to show. Um, this was uh, the next night that we made. You can see the clouds moving in. So we put together our campsite here. Uh, one of the things you'll notice with my campsite, I travel fairly light. I use sill tarps and use basically a, a, a bug tent of some sort because they can still have pretty good crops of mosquitoes in there. And this is what we used on the trip. And it it, for me, it, it works and it keeps you dry. And it's always nice on the first night on the river, you, uh, you can start to unwind. So, or the second day where you get into the tempo of floating these rivers. So uh, off we go. Uh, we had a pack raft and I believe we had two air super links, uh, the inflatables. And like I said, the young are, are showing up. So there's really, a, it's a good opportunity to see a lot of variety of wildlife as you go. And you have a limba now and then. Um, so it, uh, you know, you always have to keep your eyes open. You just can't blissfully go along and it's well worth it. You'll come across these things. This year happened to be a banner year for owls. And this was about our, our third night on the river uh, across there. That is the mouth of Fish Creek. And Fish Creek, the Dalton Highway crosses before you get to the Arctic Circle. But I, before the first time I went down, I flew that. And it is just choked with sweepers and snags. So I could tell it was not the place to be. And also here at the mouth of Fish Creek uh, is a fairly large hunting camp um, 
And I believe what these folks do, they put in and use a go devil to come down the South Fork from the Dalton Highway and then go back up river. But from this point on down farther, uh, there's really little signs of people. So, and you just have these critters as company. The other feature that we're gonna come up on not too far down here is you can see it on the topo maps. It's, and I probably mispronounce it, but it's called Holgothan Bluffs. So we're gonna be coming up on that. And if you look down in the lower right, you can see the inflatables start to see the scale of these bluffs. And they're a big uh, sediment bluff that uh, deposits uh, in there. So it's kind of a unique feature and it's on the maps as you come down. And again, owls, it was a banner crop for great horned owls. And the fun thing, you can float right up to these young owls and they're just giving you the eye as you go by. So, and this is my wife, Patty Pika, who's on. And then the other individual that came with us is a friend from Northern Nevada, Karen Boger. So I'm not sure if Karen's on the show. Um, red tail hawk, bank swallows. The flowers are still out somewhat. And unfortunately, I didn't get a good picture of this guy. He wasn't gonna stick around, but you can tell by his antler growth that this is going to be well over a 60 inch bull moose. So there's some of those in there as well. And you notice in the front of my boat, there's some sheds that uh, uh, somehow found their way into my boat. I don't know how that happened. Oh, well. Um, red tail hawk, you see quite a few nests and they let themselves be known as you come along. We got a lesser scop. And then you see plenty of signs of bear and wolves, but uh, generally you don't see a lot of them. But on this river, and it wasn't that large across, came across this big black bear. And he had his eyes a little bit further down on a cute young brown black bear. Oh, and also we have the, the white fronted geese that are coming off. So they're very vocal uh, and we had grayling that were fighting uh, you don't often see that oh there's there's the sweetheart he was chasing and yeah, she's a cutie she's got those little dark eyes and the, the brown uh, red-breasted mergansers here's a hand um, what i found of uh, floating this river up above we run into the red-breasted then down on the south fork you run into um, uh, the common merganser, which the females look fairly close. The petals from the rose hips and a lot of moose. Um, in trips past, this river is so small, sometimes the, the moose feel threatened and they'll run into the middle of the river on you, which is hard to get around them. So that's about the only obstacle in all the years of I've floated this river that uh, has caused me heartache. Plenty of little gravel bars to take a break. And you can tell the bugs aren't too bad. So um, that's always a bonus right at that period at the end of June, first part of July. So uh, this was a little disconcerting. It's not so wide. So we ended up pushing different broods. These are white fronts. And eventually they are trying to hold up and let them get out of the waterway so they don't get too spread apart. Um, so this, uh, this mother was doing the right thing for us to let us by without panicking and going down the river. Unfortunately, this one was here, but it did the right thing too and left. So a lot of wildlife on this Fish Creek portion. At this point, it's called Fish Creek before it enters into the South Fork of the Kayakuk. Um, and hey, Barry, can yeah. I interrupt for a minute? Somebody asked the question in chat, why are the tennis balls? Who sees tennis balls? 
Oh, the tennis balls on my chairs, which I've modified it. I, we have uh, we have chairs that sink into the sand. So I tried the tennis ball thing, but I've modified them still by putting uh, inch and a half uh, PVC pipe and drilling holes, and that works stellar. Just saying. The light went awesome. out, so you can't see us, but that's okay. Oh. <laughs> There's the osprey. There they had an active nest that they were going to let us know. Don't come near. Uh, beaver activity. Yeah, you, if it's towards dark, you can see a lot of beaver activity. Everybody's watching us go by. So. And now we've hit the South Fork, and you can tell. Uh, the salmon runs must be getting close. This is a glaucus gull that was on the bank. Uh, a pretty, it's a large gull. So now the substrate's kind of sent, uh, changed to sand. We're on the South Fork making camp. And again, just uh, real nice, uh, real nice settings. And then down from the mouth of Fish Creek on the South Fork, <laughs> We must be 36 miles from Malakakit by trail, winter trail, but there is the old Williams cabin site. And Harvey Williams, a young man who used to live here at this site, was worked with me at one time. He was a trapper, and uh, uh, this is their old uh, historic cabin. That's, this is all that remains these days. But you can still see some of the woodwork from the the site that they had and then his uncle charlie built a newer cabin and uh even though the signage isn't too friendly i knocked on the door but nobody was home so we just took a picture and left and that's basically anytime in this country it's active subsistence company uh country and you definitely don't want to disturb anything. Just take a picture. Traps, you'll find them hanging in trees, leave them. His decoys, leave them. Old bottles hanging in trees, leave them. Bears, leave them, don't bother them. So the South Fork has a different character than Fish Creek, uh, this Equisetum. But down near the mouth where the South Fork enters into the Kayakuk, this is an old rampway coming from a slough that I was told by the elders there was an old sternwheeler that sunk in the canoe in the slough. And this is the Union City uh, gold camp site where I think they overwintered. And across the river was Confederate City. So obviously, people with Southern heritage lived across the river, people with more Northern heritage uh, was at this site. And there's still, if you look closely, uh, you'll see stuff that's left from their presence. I mean, this is 1886 on the pump. So that came up the Kayakuk in a stern wheeler and it was part of the gold rush. So, big old birch trees, big old clouds. And you'll notice the water has changed and we've just hit the sloughs that leads us into the Kayakuk. Um, you still had some Harlequin males hanging around, which was kind of neat to see. And this is on the main Kayakuk. Bigger water now, this is plenty big water. Uh, down farther, the clear water on the left is where Henshaw Creek comes in. Um, and it flows into the Kayakuk, and you see the Kayakuk River because it drains such an immense area it is a little more chocolate colored. Uh, you can see this is a, probably somebody's spring waterfowl camp from Alakakit where they would go to shoot waterfowl passing by. And here too are a bunch of bluffs. This is Peregrine Falcon territory and they let you know it. Anytime you get close, they'll uh, they'll come down and greet you. So big uh, silt hills. And eventually down the Kayakuk, you can look off to the west and these are the hills that come around the Alatna River. 
So you can't quite see as far as Aragatch peaks, but you can see up there into the base of the gates of the Arctic National Wildlife Park or Preserve or Park. Not too far above Alakakit, you have this immense, probably a mile long stretch of permafrost that is quickly evaporating. Um, and uh, as you float by it, it smells like a barnyard. And it's that drip, the slop that builds patterns that come down off the hill like that. And even if you look into that, now don't get too close because they break off. And uh, I've seen tidal waves that happen when a big chunk hits the river. So you'd wanna keep your distance. You can see where it's dropped off there. Uh, here's a little lens of ice that's down, a wedge of ice. And even here was an antler, obviously a caribou antler, but who knows how many years old that puppy is. Now this was uh, the 4th of July. We could have probably pressed on to the village of Alakakit. One thing with the villages, you know, being a holiday, uh, they might be celebrating. So uh, just trying to be judicious and give them their space. Uh, some people like to party a little bit. And uh, so, we elected to stay upriver from Alakakit, even though I know a lot of the people there. And, uh, and that seemed to be a good thing. And this was our camp spot. And it turns out that Pleistocene bluff that was melting, I think it was that evening after we got set up, here came a boat, a bunch of young kids, and they got out on both sides of the river. They were hunting bones because uh, they sell the bones in town, either tusks or molars or, or just any bones they find. I guess maybe like the red moose or a place like that. But uh, yeah, if you look around, you can find some decent gravel to camp on. Um, there's always a little willow to tie off on. And again, that's our setup. And here we go, coming into Alakakit. It's a Koyakon village, and across the river is a Latna, which is mainly people of Kobuk, uh, Nupiak descent. And the first house you would have come to, uh, unfortunately, he just passed away within the year, is Lindbergh Bergman. And Lydia, his wife, had passed away a few years earlier, but just wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, Lindbergh is blind, was blind in one eye and hard to see out of the other and still drove his red pickup truck. But you, if you rode with him, people walking the roads in Alakakit would clear out when they saw that red truck coming down. And Lindbergh was always gracious to invite you in and, and share. These are his kakanas or skin boots, mukluks that are traditional thin uh, uh, summer caribou hide with uh, smoked moose. And probably at one time that mangy color up there was uh, maybe wolf or uh, wolverine. And there's Lydia. And she was, she was all of 410, a dog musher, just, just a sweetheart. Um, and then walking around the village, uh, you know, this is the steeple of St. John in the wilderness, uh, Hudson Stuck's uh, church that he, he had built there at this, which then created the villages of Alakakit and Alatna. Um, and unfortunately, whatever the big flood of 1995, I think it was, that uh, basically flooded out uh, this part of Alakakit. So all that's left is the steeple now. And you can see old uh, remainders of old days. They have a village store if it's open. Uh, you can always go in and, uh, and check out what's, what's on the shelf. I think spam's usually sold out, but uh, there's always something you can resupply with. They got the post office if you wanted to mail a postcard. And a few sled dogs still remain. Um, 
And it's a good opportunity if you know people there or introduce yourself. People oftentimes are real friendly and bite you in. And it's not often you can find a horseshoe crab in Alaska, let alone in Alakakit. But there you go. Stephen Bergman, uh, what a great guy. He used to be the chief. Um, and uh, he still lives a pretty traditional life. And uh, uh, he still raises his sled dogs and he had his granddaughter there. What a sweetheart she was, uh, lives in Fairbanks, but she was there helping grandpa put up chum salmon for the dogs. Uh, you see, and this is just a glimpse of life, muskrat skins. Uh, you can see the chum salmon in the tubs that you still had to process, there you go. And this is how they would set them up, get them to dry out. And people in the, these communities are pretty ingenious on, and nothing goes to waste. It may look like there might be trash laying around, but uh, they know where it is. And if they need it, they'll come and get it. And pretty resourceful considering the growing season's short. So anyway. Uh, we and we just did a walk around. We didn't want to stay in the village uh, to impede on them, but just downstream, you start running into fish camps. So this is again somebody's catching chums and setting them up for for their use. And if they're not there to guard it, uh, you're going to have company coming in to check it out. From there, we floated on down to the mouth of, uh, that's a public lands shirt, a public land owner shirt, Patty's sharing. This is the mouth of the Canudi, where it enters into the Kayakuk. And there's a nice little gravel bar just upstream on the Canudi. So makes a nice camp spot and a good opportunity to watch the sunset. So we're off again. There's Karen in her boat. And we're headed back down the river towards Hughes now. And a little ways down, we came upon, this is uh, David David and Kitty David's fish camp. This is Harold David's wife that's processing chums. Unfortunately, David David is another elder that just passed and he and Kitty. This is a mixed marriage. David David is Koyakon, Kitty is Upper Kobuk. And she was the sister to uh, Johnson Moses's wife, who uh, it was another split marriage. But this is their cabin that uh, David David then proceeded us to show us all around uh, his bear gun when they try to break in. And uh, Karen got to chat with Kitty. And you can tell they've been using the site for a long, long time. So this is a glimpse at somebody's fish camp. And they also had Harold and his wife, they had a granddaughter and a niece. So the girls entertained us with music and uh, there's Harold. And then company came by. This was one of the rare boats we saw on our float. And there's the niece doing dishes. The warning dog. And you also have uh, pop cans hanging there. Do I guess it's an early warning system if something big goes bump in the night. Uh, resourceful. You got a swing set. The girls were having fun demonstrating all this to us. So we had a nice tour of uh, a Koyakon fish camp. Uh, oh, Harold was showing us his garden. He's mixing peat in to try to get something to grow. And uh, so anyway, we cast off. Also, we heard that, that uh, Alakakit was getting a new dump truck. And there, sure enough, we had just gone a short ways and here came the dump truck. So on the barge and this was, that and that boat was one of the few motorized boats we saw the entire trip. So now we're on a big river. 
Um, and what's neat, once you start getting upstream of hues, it gets that old lichen uh, and there gets to be mountains and it's, it's real picturesque. So, and the gravel bars are, are good. We've got lots of things to check out. And one of the things to check out, if you walk these immense gravel bars, invariably there's gonna be some Pleistocene relics. This is, uh, I think a piece of tusk maybe uh, that look like driftwood and you kick it and if it isn't kind of squishy, it's probably a bone. So well, there's some of our finds from these big gravel bars down on the Kayakuk. So lots to celebrate. Oh, and as we were floating, what came along but this guy. And now that cut bank's about 15 feet and it was a deep hole and I'm right underneath of him. But I knew what he was doing. He was hunting, not me. This is what he was hunting. <clears throat> they, you can see where they dig out these swallow nests and kingfisher nests that are in the bank. You see the claw marks on there. So they just walk along those cut banks and if they find a spot they think they can get to, they'll dig them out. I can have it from now. So anyway, it was, uh, gosh, we just had wonderful weather up until just a short time down the river here. And then things started to change. I guess we got another night in before it really changed on us. There it comes. So we had a good day to go to Hughes yet, but things got wet, windy, and cold. And that Kayakuk, that wind can come up, and there are times when you can go upstream faster than going downstream. So, but even with that, there's still permafrost, ice lenses to float by, and flowers to look at. And here is Hughes. Above the hill, you see the name spelled out in the trees. Fortunately, this young man, Aaron Bergman, I knew when he was an infant. And uh, so he generously, and the elders were gone. Nobody was really in town. They were, they were at some function in, in Fairbanks. So where did they give us to set up and dry out in the rain now? but the, the village hall, which was an ideal situation. Um, it, if you're going into these villages, it's one, if you don't have contacts, make contact ahead of time. Talk to, find out who the chief is or uh, maybe the traditional elder or somebody. Uh, but this was an idyllic situation because it was wet. And it is private land along these areas. So you, you just have to be respectful as you go. And it's even as I took that picture because there's, it's a one stop sign town, but there is a stop sign here. And these homes I'm sure were put there after the flood of 95 that inundated the old part of town. So they probably threw in a stop sign too to upgrade them. Uh, you have Bifelts in Hughes. It's a smaller village than Alakakit, but um, you can really get the sense of a community if you, and it's an opportunity for them to make some money. You go to the Washateria, you need to find the person that has the coins. There, there's the Washateria coins. So you pay them for your coins, you can go do your laundry, but the Washateria is kind of like the public place. It's like the post office. You'll find posters like these. Uh, I found this one. Uh, Karen Lemkuel uh, obviously put it together, but took quotes of elders talking about climate change and the effects on their subsistence lifestyle. Like Benedict Jones. I know Benedict and uh, his wife down in Kayakuk and his comments about the change of what he's seen um, where it's raining in September now, and it usually rained in August, or break up it is earlier now, no ice out of the Kayakuk River, it just melts away. 
<clears throat> earlier hot weather and I, you know they they used to get and they still can get some cold weather but um things are changing and the elders are sharing their knowledge of that so um, i just found that interesting and then like most villages uh this is the store and uh very clean, very kept up, and memorabilia on the wall uh, of, you know, old relics and their accomplishments. And they have a church, and then waiting for the plane, just, it's an opportunity to talk to people, and uh, because they're always interested, why did you come? Where are you going? How did you get here? And, uh, so, and I'm always respectful. Can I take a picture of your beadwork? Oh yeah, please. So <clears throat> anyway, off we go and going from Hughes back to, uh, back to Fairbanks, you pass Indian Mountain, which has a gold mine and I think a military site on it. And then you start crossing some expanses of uh, large untracked areas. Uh, over on the Kiktalitna and the Ray River and some of those spots. And then eventually you cross the Yukon and back to Fairbanks. So that's my presentation. I guess, how was that? Is my screen unshared? Yep. Yeah, it is. I think um, this is Cam. Thanks, Barry. Out of the one question in the chat, I think I'd answered about what the tennis balls were for. And there's a bunch of other chat about people um, having been to some of those villages and knowing some of those people. I did have one question. Uh, it seemed like early on you used the term limba. It looked like you were talking about a tree that was hanging over but hadn't hit the water yet. I'd never heard that term. Did I? Did I hear that right? Or what is a limba? Oh, well, maybe. Uh, oh no! I was just uh, what's that? The dance that limba where you und oh. you try to get as low as you can to sneak under something. Oh, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay, that's what I was referring. I never to. heard that. I was like, oh, okay, that's a tree that has to hit the water. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the kayak, you, we sometimes challenge each other to see who can go under the, right. <laughs> the lowest point. Yeah, I've been known to do that in a canoe. So well, we do have time. If anybody has a question that he didn't get in the chat and wants to ask, I mean, I would say go for it. Otherwise, we'll um, give something away here. But last chance for questions, I guess. So Don, do you want to take over? I want to do a drawing for the hat. We want to know how Barry managed the shuttle since yeah. he flew out of Hughes. Somebody must have dropped off. No, uh, we had uh, in that one picture, uh, we had a friend, I think it was, drop us off and my 15 year old dog, uh, who didn't come down the river with us. But uh, so they just dropped us off at Bonanza Creek and then right there took us out on a, uh, a seat. Yeah. I, I fouled up a little bit on my times, but they made it work for us. Great. So we do have one more question. I'm looking at the chat now. Someone, someone would like a little bit more elaboration on the rain tarp, I guess, like what, maybe what kind it was or- whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, well, um, Initially, they were integral designs out of uh, Calgary, uh, Canada. Those are silicon embedded uh, light nylon tarps. They weigh, and I always get the 10 by 12 foot ones and use three millimeter cord you get from REI, the real thin cord. And uh, so that tarp is waterproof. And if I'm in an area that say I don't have water uh, and a rainstorm comes, it can collect water on it. And they're, they're just great. Um, so I think RAB now sells them. And I would say a 10 by 12, it probably costs about 189 bucks, something like that, or yeah. did. I don't know about the supply chain, but uh, that's about the price range it was. Thanks. And then a few people have asked, how, how many days total were you on this trip? 
This was 10 days and 205 miles. You can tell we were moving right along on some and probably in hindsight, uh, it probably would have been better if we did maybe 11 or 12, especially on that Kayakuk River. There are some uh, gold camps. You have Arctic City just upstream from the mouth of the Canudi. And upstream from that was an old uh, uh, Indian community that was set up near near Arctic City. And then across from David David's uh, fish camp, he shared with us there used to be a, an old village site over there, including one time, he doesn't go over there because he was over there and part of a skeleton was exposed. Ooh. So he, it was Uklani taboo. <laughs> wow. The only other question here is how did you prepare for the trip? And I'm thinking you've been preparing for this trip your whole life probably, but I guess they maybe mean physically. Did you do any training? I, I think that's what they're getting at. Uh, well, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> What's that for? <laughs> no, uh, sadly. And, and that's as I am getting up there in years. And like this year, I'm I want to do 1,200 river miles, and so my knees are going out on me, but my uh, my paddling skills aren't. So I plan to kick off off the Dempster Highway and come down that system, and then do the Kayakuk from Wiseman down to Alakakit, the Alatna, the Ivashak, Birch Creek. I don't know. There's a bunch I'm going to do this year if all things are good. Well, thanks, Barry. Don, I'm turning it back over to you here. Cool. Thanks. You're on. I'm on. Yes. Am um, I? Uh, you're, yes, okay. you're. You're on the. You're I'm on. on. Muted. I'm. I'm on. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you so much. Uh, and we are going to give away a hat. And uh, and uh, the. You know, we sort of pick a number and the person that is, uh, you know, in that line uh, of our guests gets the hat. And what's that number, Cam? Okay, um, 33. Oh, wait, someone has to go down and find the right person. There's, there's 57 on now. There's 57 people on. So, um, gosh. I'll stick with your number. 33 is good. Who's the 33rd person? We used to oh. count on, Dan, on who is Stan Justice used to do this really well. Maybe I should choose a lower number. All right, all right. Well, this is going to take me a minute. But I didn't realize I was going to have to do this. But um, okay. we didn't find 33. All right, I'm working on it. Uh, somebody else could help me with this too. All right, I'm, I'm a. Uh, Let's come back to this. I'm struggling with this. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm only like counting and my little thing is bouncing all over the place. How about if we do the hat after the next presentation and then I'll have time okay. to actually do it. Whoever we make it three will be you have to be present to win. <laughs> Maybe I'll just choose a super low number and it'll be a lot easier. Okay. Um, hey guys. Okay. Hey yeah. guys. Stan Justice is with me, Barb Lors. Oh. Oh, yeah. yay. He went through the grid and he said Janet S. Yes. Say hi, Stan. Hi. Hi, Stan. Yeah, Thank you. I'm glad you're on. So Janet S, do, is there a Janet S? Um, so we need uh, to know who Blue Janet S is. is. Right. And uh, kayak or canoe? Hey, um, this is Janet S, and I would like a canoe, please. Blue, Blue or green? Green. Uh, green. And I'm going to, if you could put it, if you don't mind, if you could put it in chat, uh, your full name and address, and I'll mail it to you. Or you can okay. send it directly to Karen's connection. Please. Yeah, that would, that would be great. Thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Looking forward to the next one. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I'm going to jump in um, to introduce our next presenter, Dirk Sisson. And um, I've known Dirk and his wife, Barb Hood, who I believe is also on for over 40 years now. In fact, Barb uh, was a classmate of mine. I met her my first week of law school back in 1980. And she's the one who suggested I come to Alaska after law school to clerk. 
and I did. And so she has my eternal gratitude for that. Uh, and then I met Dirk through her, of course, and we used to paddle together a lot. When we had kids and the kids were young, we did the Delta River every summer for a number of years. But then they moved to Anchorage and they opened the Great Harvest Bread Company, which many of you may know in Anchorage, although they have since sold that and they're both retired. But Dirk um, continued to do all kinds of trips down there, increasingly adventurous trips. And um, I did not join him on those. He found other people uh, more as adventurous as himself. Um, and I'm not going to steal his thunder on this, but the um, experience from last summer that he's going to talk about, I, I hesitated to ask him to present about this trip because um, I thought it might, uh, there might be some post-traumatic stress involved. Um, but as soon as I said that our club wanted to have a bit of a focus on safety this year or a renewed focus on safety, uh, he said, yes, he learned some lessons that he would like to share with the members of the club. So uh, thank Dirk for agreeing to present it. And I am gonna turn it over to Dirk. Am I on? Yep, you're there. Um, right, we don't see your screen yet, but you're there. I'm on the video, right? Can you see me and yeah, hear yeah, we can see you and hear you, yeah. Okay, well, I'll just start by, <clears throat> thanks, Cam, and i um, lived in Alaska since 1966, moved up here with my family. We uh, started paddling with my father in a <clears throat> little raft on the um, uh, Squintna and uh, um, up in that area in the Susitna uh, <clears throat> Valley uh, when I was 16 years old. Maybe it was 14, but I started paddling pretty young and uh, kept it up ever since. And as Cam said, I used to go canoeing with him down the Delta River. And um, I've done, and then also with Cam, we did the uh, Wittichik River lakes. Um, and so we've been, I've been around with Cam and done a lot of trips with my wife. And one of our goals is always to at least get out once a summer and go out to, um, uh, a river um, where we couldn't, uh, where we had to fly into off the road system. So we did that for many years. And lately I've been doing a lot of trips um, more in the Arctic, um, especially the room, the Eastern part of the Arctic in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and my wife and I also went to the Northwest part and did the Utacock River once. We've also, um, with my partner Steve Burke, um, did a trip on the outer coast from um, Icy Point to Yakutat, and we've done uh, some trips in Lake Clark National Park. So that's just a little history about some of the rivers I've done. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing this, see if I can do this fair screen. Um, um, let's see right here. Can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, welcome uh, to my presentation tonight about a close and this cast as intimate encounter with off ice in the Arctic. And that's me somewhere in the Arctic. So um, our trip plan, original trip plan was to uh, float the Congaca River along this route here. We, we dropped off on the Shing Jet. We went down the Congaca River. Uh, the plan was to float to a place called Baseline and um, hike over to the Igaxtrak River, float the Igaxtrak River, hike over to the Ichilic where we're going to drop our boats and do a backpack over to the Jago, around the Jago, drop the Jago over to the Ichilic, walk down the Ichilic, get back in our boats and float out to the coast where we were going to pick up. It was about a 200 mile trip. Um, that was our original plan. 
what ended up happening is <clears throat> we ended up getting dropped off at the on the sheen deck, which uh, then we went crossed over to the headwaters of the conga cut, floated the conga cut, and made it down to where I had my encounter with off ice, which I will go into later, and made it out to um, the um, got picked up at Drain Creek. So this portion of the trip was about 50 miles. This is the first day we got dropped off in, um, by Kirk Switzer uh, on Yukon Air. This is the runway, these little pieces of gravel up here, um, right above the Shinjek River. This is um, the Shinjek River is off to the side um, in the middle here. This is the tundra. Please notice how dry it was. There's a little bit of off ice on the river, but it wasn't too bad. And we're going to head up this valley over the continental divide to the Conga Cut. This is the chain deck again. Um, low water here. We didn't have any problem crossing it. And, uh, <clears throat> and then we started walking. We walked across again, going up to this valley. And here Steve is leaving the machine jack and going up the valley um, to where we're going to cross the continental divide to the conga cut. And again, these are the tussocks that we encountered hiking um, into the headwaters of the conga cut. The headwaters of the conga cut are actually way down here. Um, this is about a 15 mile hike that we did um, between the Shinjek before we put in the river on the Conga Cut. And I just, it was a dry, there was a low uh, winter, a low snow year, and um, just noticing how dry it was. Some caribou we ran into, um, it was pretty cool. We saw a few herds of caribou, but um, we'd done this trip a couple years ago before um, we did this in last year, and um, <clears throat> we had run into thousands and thousands of caribou back in 2000, uh, I think it was 2019. Our first night uh, between the Shinjek and the Conga Cut. Little omen here of caribou on the tundra. So our first day on the river, um, <clears throat> This is the uh, third time that Steve and I have been on this portion of the river. And there's more water than we'd ever experienced in the river. Um, so we were able to put in much further upstream than on previous occasions. This is our second night, uh, Conga Cut River in the background, beautiful skies. We had pretty good weather. Um, this is the second day on the river, our third day out. <clears throat> um, and up to this point, we're just floating down the river. The current was really good. Water was good. Um, this is really, you know, it's like class one, maybe class two in some places, some rocks, but nothing very exciting. It was just pretty good floating, a lot of fun. And up to this point, there was no off ice. And we started encountering some off ice. And, um, I'm sure you all know what off ice is, the uh, German word for overflow or when a river starts um, freezing from the bottom up and just covers a whole valley with ice. Um, there were a couple channels on this second um, day on the river. And in one instance, uh, Steve uh, had to quickly get out of his boat and get to shore because it was blocked with ice. <clears throat> but we just decided to keep going. It was a, a, a great time. The weather was good, so we kept going. Um, now we're running into bigger walls of ice, of off ice. Here the ice, if you notice, is right on the bank. And on the left-hand side, there was no ice. It was just on this side. So we're in a, not in the channel between two uh, sets of ice. <clears throat> Um, more off ice, and you can see here it breaks off, and um, 
when sometimes it breaks off, it does create a little tidal wave and you just have to watch that. You don't get too close to it. Going down, as we kept going down the river, the, um, uh, there were times there was no off ice. It was just a fun paddle going down. So we stop and have lunch. <clears throat> um, this is mid afternoon, I don't know, two, one o'clock, two o'clock. And um, <clears throat> so this is sort of the beginning of my story here about my encounter with off ice. Um, we were floating after this, after we finished lunch. So we um, started floating down and we ran into off ice. Um, but we also, we're in the main current, the main channel, but somehow we lost it. And we got onto a little shallow um, gravel bar. We both got stuck there. And we looked at each other and we started discussing whether we should get out of the river or not, or at least scout the off ice. But then we heard the main channel not too far away. Uh, we could hear the current. So we climbed up onto some off ice and drug our boats to the main current. Uh, where we put in, and then um, Steve started going ahead of me, but he got stuck on a gravel bar, and I went ahead of him. When I went ahead of him, and this was just right after um, he got stuck, I came around the corner, and I came across this wall of ice. You're probably looking at 10 to 12 feet of ice right here. The main current is headed pretty much in the middle of the photo. Off to the side here is a gravel. It's all shallow gravel. It's hard to tell from this photo, but this is a gravel bar. So I start heading <clears throat> down here um, towards the middle, and I did notice the main current going under the ice. <clears throat> so I tried to go to the left but it was too late and I hit the gravel bar and my bow, uh, I swung around so my bow was heading upstream. Now, I was not able to get out. I knew that I was going to end up under the ice and swept under the ice. So my sort of training and what I've learned is I did not want to be under my boat or with my boat under this ice. So I rolled over pulled my sway skirt off and undid my thigh straps and um, tried to brace myself with my paddle, but the current was way too strong. As I was going over, I yelled to Steve, because he was probably about uh, 50 feet behind me. I yelled, help. It was a pretty meager help but I was going over so quickly, it's the only thing I could think of to say so he would not follow me. And um, I'll get into that part because he, he didn't follow me, but that was not, I'm, I'm gonna get to that part later. <clears throat> so as I'm going under here, my first immediate reaction was, I'm dead, I'm gonna die and the current was just moving too fast. There's no way I could get out. And basically I relinquished myself to basically to die, that I was not gonna survive wherever I was going. I went underwater immediately. I did have a PFD on and a dry suit. I did not have a helmet on. So this photo, I will show you the area that I went under. So I was swept under the ice right here, and I went under the ice approximately half, half a mile under the ice right along here to where I eventually came out here. Now, as I'm going under the ice, <clears throat> my head is hitting the ice. My PFD is keeping me up and I find air pockets, so I am able to take quick gulps of breath. Um, the current's rolling me around. It's a very strong current. I'm rolling around 
under the ice. And sometimes there was no air. And I would come up and then I'd find small pockets of air, maybe two inches, maybe six inches. And knowing what you do when you get stuck in rapids and you um, are going down under a wave or you want, every time you come up, you take a gulp of air. And that's what I started doing. Um, I think it's important to let you know that not, this whole time I never panicked. I was very aware of my breath and being trying to be as calm as possible. I took in a little water, but I was not drowning and I kept pretty calm the whole time. At some point, um, I even rolled it under the ice got to the point where or the water pushed me up under the ice and I thought, okay, I am going to die. And all I could think of was um, wishing Barb, my wife, um, a good life. Um, I wasn't, didn't say I was sorry or anything like that. I just hoped that she had a good life. So once I began finding those air pockets, I started thinking that I would be able to live if I could keep finding air pockets whenever I'm going under the ice with current bouncing along rolling around but I kept finding those air pockets I could also hear gravel rolling underneath me as the current was taking gravel down this channel at one point the current flowed and I was swept into a shallow area underwater and felt I felt like I might get wedged between the ice and the gravel. So my instinct was I needed to get back into the main current. So I swam and grabbed the gravel and moved over into the main current. Eventually I started seeing light, <clears throat> not the kind of light you think, but I started seeing real light and all of a sudden it got lighter and lighter, and I saw more light coming in the distance. Then I was swept out from under the ice. But now I was in the main current, and I still had to get to shore somehow. The current here is very strong, and I was trying to swim, I was trying to walk, I was trying to do anything to get over here. But I couldn't get over here. And by the way, what you're looking at here is my off ice on land. And this is a big, all oh, this is all off ice. And I will show you a channel that I went down in a later photo. So here I am going down the river. This is a picture of off ice right here. This is the channel I went down. I was floating down here. Off ice on my right hand side the shore on my left hand side and I'm struggling, grunting like a bear to get off onto the <clears throat> onto shore. But I was very determined at this point that to stay alive, I had made it from under the ice. I was, it was miraculous. I could not believe I was alive. So I end up coming down here and this is, I probably floated another half a mile down the river before I found, saw this rock here, and I grabbed this rock, grabbed this rock, and pulled myself onto shore. I was shaking uncontrollably. I didn't realize this, but I was freezing. I was so cold. Even with my dry suit on, it got a little damp inside, but I knew that I had to start moving. I was um, not gonna die of hypothermia. I, I was alive. So I started just moving my arms up and down and walking this beach, walking up and down this hill here. And eventually I started to get warm. Now, this whole time, I, as I was getting warm, I'm thinking survival. One, I don't have any communication device on me. I have no food with me. I will get into that later. And um, but I have a dry suit, and the only thing I lost underneath the ice was my paddle. I kept my glasses on, 
I kept my waterproof camera on. I had my spray skirt on. Of course, I had my dry suit. Underneath my dry suit, I just had shorts and um, a nylon shirt. Oh, as so I started thinking about how to survive, I knew I could survive for three days on just water. And my wife and I had a contract sort of that if she hadn't heard from me on my inreach in three days, that she would contact the rescue people. Um, and then I started thinking about Steve. Um, and then I started going, is he alive? And then how am I going to explain his death if he's gone? And I knew that the inreach was in my boat. And I didn't, <clears throat> the boat, um, I'll get to that in the next photo, you'll see, um, was in my boat. So I had, I thought Steve had no way to communicate and how he was going to get help. So I was walking up and down and I found, I, I decided that I needed to go back to where I went in. And this is approximately right here is where I went in. And this is where I went down. If I got up on this hill and this ridge, there was a big canyon here and I couldn't get down it. So I walked up there about three times looking for Steve across here. And um, it was windy. And so I decided I needed to get off the ridge and find a place that I could uh, hunker down for the night. <clears throat> so one last time I walked up onto this ridge and I saw a little figure here and I knew it had to be Steve and I was elated. So I started to walk, I had to walk up this ridge that you can't see here to um, head on this direction. And in the meantime, Steve is out here and I'm gonna to get to that here in a second. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So this is the part Steve saw. He's the one that this picture, I showed you this picture before. My pack raft had somehow, if you can see a little red dot in there, my pack raft had somehow gotten wedged between the ice and the gravel. And Steve had been able to get off onto the shallow area where there was a gravel bar. Remember the main current was here. Somehow as I was going over, my boat must have flipped back up and got under the, and somehow got under the ice and wedged. So <clears throat> Steve fortuitously took this photo. He wanted some way to record what had happened. And as Steve has told me, as he saw me going underneath here, in his mind, I'm gone. And he had no idea that I was alive at this point, that I had actually made it under the river, under the ice, and had made it to shore. In his mind, all this off ice, I'm out there somewhere in the middle, and no one's ever going to find my body. So Steve put this boat on, onto a place that was safe on the gravel and managed somehow to get on his belly in this water, it's probably eight inches of water on top of the gravel, managed to pull my boat out. The boat was full of water and he kept tugging and tugging. At one point, ripping out of the carabiner that um, was holding my bow bag on. And he knew my inreach was in there. It was our only inreach that we had. And it was in the bow of my, of the bow bag on, in my boat. So he had to somehow, he knew he had to get that. As he was tugging it, um, he finally got it out and it was full of water. He thought maybe I might just be behind it, but it was just the heavy, the water made the boat so heavy. It's probably 200 pounds with all the water in there. He, um, it was a very risky move on his part to get here because 
This ice could collapse at any moment. Um, now remember, I am not aware that he had retrieved my boat and the communication device. So <clears throat> the next photo, um, I'm gonna jump ahead here because this is three days after, and I will tell you what happened to Inspired about that, but we were picked up three days later at an airstrip near D Drain Creek by Kirk, and he flew over where I had gone under. Three days later, or at some point during the time that we were waiting for Kirk, this channel had opened up, and this is the channel I went through. Remember, it was covered with ice. I went under this completely under ice, and that's where I floated down here to where I came out on the shore over here. So I mentioned before, I started hiking up a ridge here, this ridge here, and that's when I saw Steve, and that's when Steve saw me. He had, in the meantime, I'll get back to that in a second. In the meantime, he had pulled my raft out, pulled it up onto this off ice, unloaded the boat, and uh, put it, all our stuff into our backpacks. And um, obviously he was not about to get back in the river, but he had um, put our backpacks up on a hill here so that I saw these from this distance. This is probably a mile. And um, I also saw him down here. He was uh, getting water for a cup of coffee. I went under the ice about 3, 3.30 p.m. And he saw me, we got, to, he, we were apart for about five hours. He saw me around 8, 8.30. And in the meantime, he had also gotten my inreach and had started texting uh, the, he, he hit the SOS button, and I'll get to that in a moment. So when Steve sees me, he sees me on this ridge over here, his first impression is I'm a bear. And the reason he thinks I'm a bear is I have a yellow PFD on it, and he probably thought that, wow, it's a tan bear, that looks like a bear. So he runs back up, gets his binoculars, looks real close, and he sees it's a hiker. So he really started thinking, oh gosh, I need to talk to him. I need to talk to this person. He looks closer, and he sees my dry suit. So once he says, oh my God, it's Dirk, he runs this whole distance over here to where he directs me down um, a real steep path down into a ravine. And that's when I hug him and tears start rolling out of my eyes. I was so happy to see him. He pulls out the inreach and I asked him, oh, so you brought your own? He goes, no, I got your boat out. And I, I was really confused. So the next slides I wanna show you are going to be slides of the text messaging between Steve and the International Rescue Response and Coordination Center, which is located in Texas. So he hits the SOS button, it reaches the IERCC. I have an emergency, I need you to send help. This is the IE. RCC, what is your emergency? <clears throat> emergency, boating accidents, one drown. So, um, emergency services are working on a plan of action to get your location. What is your emergency? Boating accident. Name and age of individual. Any other injuries? Dirk Sisson, 66. And he goes, I am okay. How many people in party? Two people. Steve Burke, 60. We have informed emergency services. Please confirm who we are speaking to and then the name of the person who drowned. Victim, Dirk Sisson. 
this is a very telling part too. Body not recoverable. So in Steve's mind, this whole time, I am gone. And I tell you, I would have done exactly the same thing. If you looked at that ice, you wouldn't have known that anybody could survive. Body not recoverable. Confirmed, we will let you know once we receive an update from emergency services. Then they had him call the Alaska Rescue Coordination Center, which I did not have in my phone. And so remember, he's in an inReach. You're not talking, it's all texting and it's using a cursor key to get from letter to letter to letter to letter. So it's very time consuming, very hard to do on the inReach itself. And we did not, we were not using iPhones to talk to the inReach. So it was uh, all hand done on the, the larger inReach, not the tiny one. And he is um, also at, at some point has his glasses were misplaced so he can hardly see anything. Um, so it's very difficult, your hands are wet, um, a lot of stuff going on. Um, he gets hold, the finally, we, he starts getting hold of the uh, Alaska Rescue Coordination Center. I'm not going to read it all here, but as he's going down, Steve, are there any other injuries? Can you give me an idea of what happened so we know what we need to send your way? Boating, accident, drowning, birth system, understood, are you stranded? Um, and um, so as he's going down, he wants to make sure he doesn't have to cancel the SOS button because the battery level within reach, you can't, it's not using um, the cell batteries. It's a lithium battery that can only be charged with um, a USB port. Um, <clears throat> and um, he mentions that all my gear and his gear were, um, they have, he has everything. He's trying, should I stay put or try to hike out? Um, he asked somebody to call my wife and <clears throat> um, they asked him, what were you doing pack rafting? They asked him who took us out there. He's also saying, I'm not sure if I'm in a good head space. What are my options? Um, if you don't feel like you can continue, we'll start making the calls to get a helicopter heading your way. Um, the state troopers will he would con they'll contact the state troopers. Um, and then if you if you had uh, and so again, he was um, looking at all the uh, location of the airstrip. So he finally gets a hold of Quick Twitter. And Quick Kirk mentions a um, place that we can go to get picked up on Drain Creek and that's what we decide. And then finally, um, we end up camps. Uh, he runs over to me. He says, oh, Turk is alive. He came out way down the river. And are you with him now? What's the status? He's pretty traumatized. And then they ask a bunch of, you know, is he OK? He is good. He said he can hike to Drain Creek tomorrow. We'll contact Yukon Air, Yukon Air at which point then we cancel the RCC uh, they had, uh, they were going to send helicopters out from Fairbanks at 0700 the next day, and we canceled that. So this is, I don't know what those red lines are, but um, I don't know where they came from. But anyways, we ended up um, hiking the next day out to the airstrip here on, on Drain Creek. At Drain Creek, I just wanted to show you uh, a robin in the Arctic. Um, that was pretty cool. It was whistling the art of the Robin uh, songs. Really nice. So um, I want to talk about safety lessons learned. One of the things that Steve came up with is that it's the situation, not the destination. So we underestimated our situation in the off ice. I guess you could say we were complacent. Um, we knew we should have gotten out. We didn't get out and at least scout. And 
we didn't want to stop paddling that day. We were having a good time and we had some goals that we wanted to reach that day and some locations. So, um, wanted to, one of the safety things is always scout off ice. The channels need to be scouted when you enter areas with significant off ice. There were ice on both sides of the river could indicate potential constriction of river and main current submerging under ice. Just remember off ice is unpredictable. The magnitude depends on winter climate, snowfall, temperature, other factors. And it varies from uh, year to year. The amount seen in 2021 exceeded any local memory. Kirk, um, the pilot said he hadn't seen that much off ice in uh, for 25 years, his theory was a low snow year created all this off ice. Here's some pictures of the off ice that um, we uh, this covers up the whole valley. So the current doesn't always follow the banks and the main channels can be in the middle of the river. So, um, Communication devices. Um, I learned that I always carry it on myself. In my, when I'm in my boat, I always carry it. Um, have a little pouch underneath your dry suit that um, you put it in around your waist with a little food and some first aid supplies. And in this instance, if Steve, if we both had communication devices, we could have communicated with each other and I could have told them that I was alive. Make sure that the emergency contacts are in your in reach or your communication device, and especially um, the local rescue coordination center and pilot contact information. And make sure that the emergency contacts know what to look for and what to do. On another note here, this is uh, uh, the International Emergency Rescue Coordination and a phone call to Barb right after he had initiated the SOS. And they asked him, uh, they let him know that Dirk Sisson had activated his SOS and she was the emergency contact. She was not able to, she, she saw this as she was driving to pick up a friend at the airport and pretty much ignored it until the next day. And actually she thought it was spam from Montgomery, Texas. So um, we also had an agreement that I would, as I mentioned before, we would contact, I would contact her every uh, night with a preset text that just said, I'm okay. If you hadn't heard from me for three days, that's when I would request help. So I don't know what we're gonna do about that situation in the future, um, but that was our plan. So in the last slide, I just wanna show you um, we made it home fine. Barb had a little party for us with uh, Steve's partner and myself and Barb. Um, I want you, of course, we celebrated with beer. Um, and I want you to see, I don't know how this happened, but um, we got these two cool cans looking out for you. And tomorrow is here. Um, <clears throat> and Barb got me a puzzle so that I could spend more time at home. And um, that was um, that's the story. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this. I'm very grateful and humbled to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Dirk. Thanks again for um, being willing to share that story. I think, I think we have time for questions if anyone wants to, um, or, or comments. Actually, I'm trying to look at the chat as I'm talking here. But we have time if anybody wants to jump in. Oh, Dirk, thanks for sharing that. This is John Shower. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, uh, yeah, there is actually uh, uh, Alaska Y, American Whitewater just recently opened a new category of reports for accidents, including even this is for pack rafting. And uh, Luke Mel's been trying to tabulate, you know, 
globally um, back craft accidents and with, with the, and there was a very few fatalities this year, but there were, were several, but a lot of times the near misses never make it into the American Whitewater database or into some of, uh, Luke's been keeping track of these internationally and what kinds of factors contribute to them. So really thank you for the safety <laughs> heads up. And, you know, a lot of times my inReach is sitting in my bow bag or dry bag instead of in my, uh, inside my, body. that's, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much for letting me do this for my first time now to publicly talk about this. And um, I feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, I, I, I attribute some of my um, time under the ice and not panicking and breathing. I, I, I do yoga and I meditate every day. And I, I think that really helped a lot to keep myself calm and um, I feel like that was a <clears throat> part of the uh, survival that, that, that kept me surviving. Also, I think it's important to know that um, there, there were air pockets that underneath the ice, and that's what saved me. If I, if I didn't have those air pockets, I don't know, think I would have uh, been able to, I would have drowned. I have to say when uh, I was before this presentation, I was thinking about of all the people I know, Dirk is probably the most likely to be able to survive that situation. I mean, not panicking under the ice um, is pretty, pretty amazing. Don't think I could have done it. Um, Tom wants to know when you're going to finish the trip, though. I mean, you didn't you didn't finish your trip there. So. <laughs> well, well. We looked at going up there this summer, but everyone's booked and it looks really crowded up there. <laughs> um, Kirk, Kirk is like, his, his rates have gone way up, right there is totally booked. Dirk with Coyote Air is booked. <laughs> <laughs> well, kudos to Barb for being, not trying to prevent you from doing more trips like this. God, I mean. Um, I hope to do more, Cam. I, I do <laughs> hope to do more. Oh. Yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you guys letting me do this. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, Don, I don't know if you're following the chat. It looks like Phil, Phil Schaefer is asking if he could do a quick five minute thing. I don't know what it's on, but um, if folks want to hang in there, it's what, 830? I'm, I don't have a problem with that. I would say yes, Phil, okay. if you've got, keep it to five minutes and, uh, and then we're going to get uh, a hat giveaway. No, the hat got given away. Oh, the hat got given away. Oh, okay. Yep. All right, Phil, take it away. Okay. Well, uh, Dirk, you're far more adventurous and uh, ambitious uh, paddler and, and hiker than I've ever been, but uh, I, I've heard way too many stories similar to yours. And in fact, my very first canoeing experience in Alaska, we ended up five or six miles from the nearest road with a canoe and all of our gear pinned in the middle of the river. Uh, so I've taken a, a very early interest in survival and emergency situations in the wilderness. On top of that, I'm a private pilot uh, in Alaska. <laughs> uh, I've been to a lot of different survival presentations and classes over the years. And, you know, the big thing that strikes me, I uh, had an incident with one of my paddling partners last summer where he pinned his canoe, all of his gear stuck in it. Uh, and the big thing that struck me about your story and his situation is they had absolutely nothing on their person. Uh, one of the things, if you go to any aviation safety or survival seminar, the first thing they tell you is your survival gear is what's on your person. Uh, this really struck home. We had a real tragic situation in Alaska uh, 12 or 15 years ago. A pilot crashed in the winter. Uh, his plane caught on fire. He managed to get out of the plane without getting burned, but both his legs were broken in the fire. All of his emergency gear was in a bag in the back seat that was burning up. When they found his body the next day, they could see the tracks in the snow where he had crawled 50 feet away from the burning wreckage through the snow with two broken legs 
and then crawled back to try and stay warm. He eventually froze to death. No survival gear, no way to start a fire on his person. So I made a quick run down to my garage. This is the life vest I've been using the last few years. It's a fisherman's life vest with lots of pockets on it. Uh, after our incident last summer where I was in the lead, the guy that was in trouble was in the middle. The only reason I knew at all he was in trouble is I looked back and spotted his bright red life vest 100 feet from his bright green canoe. This is the life vest I'm going to be using this summer. <laughs> in that life vest, one pocket has my car keys. my flint striker. Uh, if you've never used these, they're really easy. I use them to start all my campfires now. They produce a really impressive shower of sparks. Uh, of course, my emergency whistle. One pocket has my spot beacon in it. So it's always, always, always on my person when I'm on the river. Uh, incidentally, I recently upgraded. The new spots have a extra button that has a custom message. Mine's programmed to everybody's okay, but we're running behind. We're going to be a few days late. Um, I'm a big fan of fire. I have a bright orange butane lighter. Waterproof baggie with some cotton balls that have Vaseline on them. Um, my Swiss Army knife compass. <laughs> Generally in Alaska, we're paddling parallel to a road. If you know there's a road to the east, you know which way to go. Uh, never leave home without my multi-tool. My multi-tool, make sure you get one with a saw. Even a tiny saw is really handy. I have a little plastic signal mirror. This is one with the hole in the middle for aiming. Uh, you can probably see mine still got the scratch guard on it. It's brand new. So it'll be nice and shiny if I ever need it. And it's cliff bars. <laughs> a couple of cliff bars. Um, you know, if you're cold and soaking wet, don't underestimate the value of, can of calories. Uh, other thing, usually not in my life vest, but always on my person, my wallet. I do have to hike out the road, hitch a ride. Boy, it's awfully nice if I can buy a meal when I get to the first town. Um, the other thing is, you know, my cell phone. Apple says it's waterproof. I don't trust them. This is a waterproof floating cell phone case. So yeah, that's the minimum stuff that is on my person anytime on, I'm on the river, whether it's the upper China or the lower Galcana or someplace more remote, hopefully someday. Thanks, Phil. So Don, I think we're going to actually at some point offer like a session where we demonstrate packing, say, you know, safety oriented packing for trips in different kinds of boats, right? I don't know that we have that on the schedule yet. But. Right. Uh, I will say that we are working, uh, trying to work up several uh, dry land sessions. Um, your, your active board hasn't uh, worked out all the details, but hopefully in uh, probably March, late March or early April, we'll have some sessions on preparing for trips and uh, packing for trips and safety will be integrated into everything. And uh, we hope that you guys will be interested and uh, attend these. And um, we will also uh, have some um, trips that will teach us how to better mentor uh, inexperienced paddlers. We, people like Phil, who've had uh, 
a lot of experience, um, can help the club out by sharing some of his uh, knowledge. And we would like the rest of you guys to also, those of you who are longtime paddlers, to uh, begin to mentor some of our newer members. So that's coming up and we're working out a schedule for uh, some paddling events and sort of mini courses and, uh, and, some, and some fun things. So the next trip will be, uh, next trip, next presentation is March the 24th. And uh, Jack Mosby is going to give us a presentation on his trip from last year. And um, Jack, as you probably all know, is like Mr. Alaska River. So don't miss that one. And on the seventh, uh, Cam and Tracy and I and selected others are gonna make a presentation on our trip last summer on the Nigu and the Atiblik. Uh, also, don't miss it. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we hope to uh, see you online on Zoom on March the 24th. Good night, everyone. Yep. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for putting this great presentation on. Okay. Thank you, Barry.